to the program. I'm David Spears. We're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight. And joining me on the panel, Executive Director of the Equality Institute, Emma Fulu, Telstra CEO and Managing Director, Andy Penn, in Sydney, health policy expert and former head of Australia's finance department, Jane Holton, author and journalist, George Megalogenis, and musician, disability advocate and writer, Eliza Hull, who'll also be performing for us a little later on. Um, so my question is in regard to the concept of hybrid working. Um, what legislation exists to ensure that those who are hybrid working are not exploited because they have the tools at home and are connected to their workplaces outside of their contracted work hours? Alicia, let me just ask, has your family experienced this feeling of being exploited through working from home? Well, um, I'm a teacher and so um, I can empathise with, um, with the Tony. gentleman over here yeah. and um, you know, everything you're saying about working till midnight and up at five and all the meetings and that's, I think, just part and parcel of, you know, the job and I think sometimes we think, oh, that's okay because I get, like, 11 weeks school all day so I can have some time to relax then. But um, in Anton's case, my husband, he's not a teacher but having to work from home and also um, go and maybe even, yeah, hybrid working, go on site for certain things and, um, yeah, at the moment um, he's having, because he has a lot, he's a digital content producer, he's got a lot of equipment in our only spare room, which is our nursery so Grace is having to sort of compromise her first room. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think it's, yeah. it's, it's good in a sense, but if you don't have, like, the facilities to enable that, and not everyone has that, like, we have a two-bedroom apartment and um, we want to get a house and we want to get a bigger yeah. place, but in Melbourne that's not so easy because of the current situation with houses and that's just another argument but um uh, yeah that's yeah, a, that, so that, no that's a that's a very good point jane let me come to you on this i mean work from home has been i suppose different for everybody who's done it but mm -hmm. is there a problem here of some employers exploiting those who are working from home you know making them do more than they should so, David, let's be clear, we're not going to fall over a finish line with the pandemic, are we? And these sort of hybrid approaches to work, what we've got to do is figure out how we're going to make those sustainable. And I think people are right to be a bit concerned that the expectation is everyone's working 24-7 because we can't do that. And we know that our employees, regardless of what industry you're in, are reassessing, actually, what they value. So, while we don't necessarily have the tools yet and we don't really have a way to describe this. I think what we need to do for an employer is actually listen to our staff and start thinking really thoughtfully about what it is is going to be, if you like, the approach to the new workplace. Because we're not going back to where we were and that's probably a good thing. Mm. But I think this approach to hybrid working and being cognizant that people have families and responsibilities and when they actually work, it can be great to have flexibility. But, you know, if, if a baby needs a sleep during the day, you don't want to be in there editing digital material at the same <laughs> no, time. Yeah. She is going to need a nap. So yeah. we've got to figure that out. Yeah. Now, well, Eliza, let me bring in you here because... Uh, well, tell us about your experience when it comes to work from home. We've, we've heard some of those who, you know, feel concerned about how it's worked. But what about you? Yeah, well, I'm a person with disability. So I, I have a physical condition called Charcot-Marie-Tooth. And so that affects the way that I walk and um, I fatigue easily, I'm in pain. And so working from home has been incredible <laughs> um, because I don't have to have that time where I'm commuting and it's draining. Yeah. You know, for many people with disability, it's, you don't even know if you're going to be able to get through the front door. Mm. You don't know if you're going to be met with an Auslan interpreter if you're deaf. So there's a lot of barriers even to get into the workplace. So I think that actually this is a, a really great leveller and a great way for people with disability, many people with disability, to be included in the workforce finally. That's a really powerful point. It's a great... Yeah. Indeed, a great leveller for people with a disability. Um, do you feel that in your own career that you have actually uh, been going through a, a period of much greater productivity and success? Yeah, look, I think it's also uh, important to be clear that still people with disability are underemployed. If you're a person with disability, you're twice as likely to be 
unemployed. You know, you're twice as likely not to be employed at all. Mm. And so I think it's important that we state that. But for me, it's it's been absolutely incredible um, because I haven't been in as much pain. I've been less fatigued, and that is because I haven't had to, you know, go into the office, not know if there's going to be stairs that I can't get up, yeah. not know if I'm going to be able to get through the door. Those are the things that, you know, are, are big barriers for people with disability. Yeah, well, I, it, it is different experiences when it comes to work from home, and, you know, Eliza, yours has certainly been a positive one. We heard from Alicia, and I think uh, little Grace has, um, has just, had to t <laughs> just had to take off momentarily. But, George, can I bring you in here? Because um, what Alicia was talking about... Uh, resonates with some figures that were released this week from the Australia Institute Centre for Future Work that, on average, um, people are working, what is it, 6.1 hours of unpaid work a week. That's risen. Um, what do you think about this? Some countries like Portugal and France are now putting bans on uh, employers contacting their workers after <laughs> office hours. They can be fined if they do so. Do we need to go that far here? You'd remember, David, as journalists, when the pager first entered our universe yes. and then the mobile phone and the assumption was in our work, and it's obviously an assumption in many, in many workplaces, certainly in the public sector. Certainly teachers would have had this assumption. Once you were contactable at all hours, uh, people were on your back. And the other thing is you felt, especially in the early transition phase through this sort of always-on yeah. uh, work model, you felt obliged, <laughs> A, to pick up the phone, B, to volunteer something. So I'm not surprised that we've added the equivalent of a half day, working an extra half day for no reason, for no pay. Australia's in a... Again, we're in a very, very strange position culturally because we've, we're still in the middle of this great deregulation experiment. We're at about 30 years' worth now of... Uh, trusting employers and employees to sort things out for themselves. We've deunionised the workforce. Um, we've sort of suppressed the wages of ordinary workers. We've suppressed the wages and the headcount of the public sector. So there's really no signal out there like there used to be in the past. You know, you don't have a golf whitlam doing an equal pay um, uh, submission to the, to the old Industrial Relations Commission to try and uh, break the gender gap in, in terms of pay in the public sector. You don't have one of those, you know, very organised, like the metals workers leading, doing test cases on, on a 40-hour week or doing test cases on an extra couple of days annual leave. So, so this negotiation, unfortunately, is corporation to individual, mm. organisation to individual, and the only leverage in, uh, individuals have at the moment is the collective burnout for the last 18 months. And the fact that the borders have been closed also for the last 18 months, we can't fill jobs that Australians can't do. And there are jobs that Australians could do that many Australians don't want to do because the terms and conditions in which they've been set, because their recent memory of life leading up to lockdown was, they're going to ask me yeah. to work an extra day. I'm probably going to go into an environment where they'll probably let somebody else go and I'll be picking up their... It's, Again, it's... Yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry, I go just, for it. No, I just wanted to jump in. I thought that, um, you know, I think we've been talking about... We don't actually know what's going to happen in Australia, and I think that's, that's very true. But what we do know is that the themes that are coming out of the US, the key th reasons that people are reporting that they're resigning is the search for greater meaning, which we've kind of talked about, worsening work-life balance and actually toxic workplace cultures. And I think if we think about worsening uh, work-life balance, which I'm sure many of us have experienced, that this is really a gendered issue as well. And if you think about the industries that we've seen the great resignation from, it's education, it's healthcare, it's aged care, um, and it's hospitality, which are female-led, often um, insecure workforces, often from communities have historically been marginalised and they're not only sort of experiencing this increased burden mm. of work and stressful work but also often picking up the unpaid um, care burden at home inc including homeschooling. So I think it's not surprising that we're sort of seeing this burnout but this burnout is also about structural inequality and I want us to kind of come back and sort of well, remember yeah, that it's, a very it's good not point. about just individuals, there's some systemic things that we need to change. We are going to come to that too and how this has been... <laughs> yeah, uh... Andy Penn, happy International Men's Day for tomorrow. This generation of men want to play a greater part in the raising of their children. However, parental leave and flexible work are still options largely reserved for women. 
Research shows that men are twice as likely to have their request to work flexibly rejected and that men who choose to work flexibly are less likely to be promoted than women who work flexibly. At Telstra, what are the rates of men and women taking up flexible work and primary parental leave? Have you set targets for men to take up these options? And what are you doing to ensure that men who work flexibly are just as likely to be promoted? Andy Penn. Well, thanks very much, Walter. And it's a, it's a great point. And um, we have actually, I'm trying to think when we did it, it was a couple of years ago now, um, introduced parental leave, paid parental leave for dads um, as well. And so... Um, and how long is that? 16 weeks. Right. So, um, and, and we've had... <laughs> and, and we've had a, a good number of men in our organisation that have taken it. And, um, and again, I think... Um, I don't want to keep going back to the hybrid working, but I think the point about flexibility mm. enables a family to be able to work together to work out what is the best way um, that they can I think sort of work together. Walter's asking too about the uh, comparative rates. I don't know if you have those off the top of your head, but compared to women, are men it, taking up that leave? Yes, they are, but I mean, overwhelmingly, um, it's more women that take up that leave. But, but it's there and it's available. We've got lots can of I... examples where. Uh, okay. men are taking advantage of it. Yeah, Emma? I, I mean, I think one of the reasons we know that even when there are policies in place that there isn't actually as much uptake from men is because the social norms that, it's, you know, guide our society mm. haven't yet caught up in mm. a way to those policies. So I think some of the work we need to do is to work on changing social norms to encourage and create that environment where men feel like they can... Um, play that equal care giving role and then there's other policies that also need to support that including things like free publicly funded early childhood education which Australia really doesn't have at the moment and so these gendered issues it's not just about mm. sort of creating one policy unfortunately that's going to change things but we we need multiple efforts that are going to address that the gender pay gap the superannuation mm. gap as well play into that and Emma you touched on it earlier I do want to come back to it how the pandemic has differed for men and women, and in particular with work from home, which we've been talking about tonight, has it been a different experience for, for, for blokes and, and for women? Well, we know, we know that it fundamentally has. Unfortunately, um, the vast majority of people who have taken up that kind of unpaid caregiving role at homeschooling is, is women. I think there was a McKinsey study mm. that showed that um, uh, women with young children, I think, were 23% reported that they were considering resigning or downsizing their careers compared to only 16% of, of men. So women are, are doing that. Also, we know that the industries that were most affected by COVID, whether that was our frontline workers who were kind of um, putting their own safety at risk to take care of us, vast majority of women-led uh, sectors, the ones that um, women were much, much less likely to get JobKeeper, they were first to lose JobKeeper, they're being the first to kind of um, have their, you know, have the, have their um, their industries affected by resi um, sorry by um, redundancies. If you think about the insecure and casualised workforce, so it's been. I mean, people think that actually potentially the COVID impact has set back gender equality decades, and unfortunately, the policies um, have not really taken that into account. Eliza, what about? your experience when it comes to sharing the parenting duties during the pandemic. Has is, is, is that been what's happened or has it been a bit different for you? It's been <laughs> completely different for me. Yeah, so, I, you know, what you were just saying, Andy, so my partner got three months paid leave. So when I was just uh, gave birth last year, so we had a newborn at the time and so he got those three months paid leave. And then we were able to suddenly both merge into working from home. I worked on a book that's coming out next year on parenting um, with disability called We've Got This. He was able to, you know, work in the office and the office was just in the studio. And so then we were homeschooling and my six-year-old daughter would, uh, you know, say to, say to my partner, Carl, Hope the traffic's OK. <laughs> and he would walk a couple of steps and uh, go into the office. And then he would come inside and we could have lunch together. And then I would have a break. And then he would have a, a break. And we could take the parenting load. And I would do some homeschooling and he would do some homeschooling. So mm. for me, it was the opposite. Um, but That's I have a, heard yeah. from many people that that is not the case mm. and that, unfortunately, we've still got so so yeah. far to go because some men 
do, just get to work in the office and shut the door, and the women take the load. Yeah. I'm a, I mean, I've got three young children. Um, great, uh, you know, I'm a, a single parent. Um, I have a great, you know, their dad is an amazing co-parent and we split time week on, week off. And so when I have them, it's three of them at home trying to run a business and mm. homeschooling. It was literally impossible, yeah. you know, and I just think the burden on sole parents in particular, um, I just can't <laughs> express how, how challenging it was and... And yeah, I, 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 can, yeah. I can imagine. Uh, George, um, let me ask you, I do like to ask you big picture questions. <laughs> As the pandemic, this has been often noted, shone a bit of a light on existing inequalities, whether it's gender inequality, and we've had a lot of focus on that, particularly earlier in the year, uh, racial inequalities. Um, is, is this something that's, ag again, coming to the fore when we talk about these issues about the workplace now as well? Yeah, look, I want to I, I frame... It's a good question, and I want to frame this by thinking about what is the... Uh, what is the thing that the society spat out that you didn't expect, but once it happened, you thought it was always coming? That COVID... Mm. You know, I'm, asking, I'm, I'm asking you all to, th to put your ha thinking ha caps on and think about which social movement exploded this year. Now, we obviously took a cue from the US last year with Black Lives Matter, and that didn't seem to take off. There was another cue from uh, the US, which was a, a sort of anti-vaxxer, um, you know, Viking raid on um, on the capital. That doesn't seem to be taking off. Is that what off. we're seeing a bit of in, in Victoria, of, this, in Melbourne? There's a bit Melbourne of performance at the margin, but I don't think it's taking off. But something did, did really blow the, earlier this year, and that was, uh, from the moment Grace Tame was... Uh, was uh, uh, Named awarded, Australian of the Year. Australian yeah. of the Year, and then Brittany Higgins uh, brought her, her story forward. It's almost as if that was the collective mm. moment where the women of Australia said, right, we've had it with you guys. Mm. And I think that that, that was the, the pressure cooker of COVID last year, and there are a couple of structural issues that were there from the start, but COVID's done something else. So COVID is the first... So the health part of the lockdown, which brought on a recession is the first one since the early 60s where the majority of jobs laid off belong to women. So we're still 160,000 jobs short of where we were, I mentioned earlier, where we were in February of last year. Two-thirds of those jobs belong to women. Recessions in the mid-70s, the early 80s and the early 90s, eight out of ten of the jobs that went in those recessions belonged to men. Blue-collar workers in manufacturing, construction, mining and the like. This time around, it's women in the... Performance, sec uh, performance in the arts, in education, because we've obviously, for some reason, the federal government wanted to do a drive-by on higher education, which they pulled off. There was also um, uh, a bit of burnout in health, uh, a bit of difficulty in teaching, and a couple of other sectors too, hospitality, restaurants, cafes. Well, so when you, when, you, when you impose a burden like that on two-thirds of the workforce, yeah, and then you felt. expect them to do the homeschooling at the same time, yeah, there's going to be a Young kids Jane. or kids approaching year 12, first year uni and stuff, something had to click. Yeah. Jane, something had to snap do you, and it do, did. Do you agree, Jane, with, uh, with what George is saying there? A absolutely. And I think we just need to be clear that women are sick of it. <laughs> and there's not a <laughs> woman <laughs> sick of it. And there's not a woman I know who hasn't got a story. And they'll share that story with you if you ask them. I've got stories, everyone I know has got a story. And let me tell you that the thing that we know, particularly with lockdowns, is that some of the things, and this is why I think Grace Tame absolutely hit a nerve with people, what's been exacerbated, it's been things like domestic violence. Mm. And so being able to say, we're over this, we need to do this differently, the comment was made earlier about social norms, that is so true, we need to say, unambiguously, it's not OK. And it's not OK unless someone says it's OK. So that, that's why I think, it, I think George is absolutely right. This has struck a chord. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking older women, women in their 70s, women in their 80s, they're all talking about it. And let's hope that that galvanises change. We've seen some changes in legislation coming, which I think mm -hmm. is fantastic in relation to consent, um, but I think we need much more than that. And to go to the earlier conversation, David, um, if you look at societies that are more equal than here, if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, where men actually get equal access to maternity and paternity leave, where men take an equal share, in the raising of those children. Not only do they have a great relationship with their kids, but the women can get on with their lives and their work as well. So let's hope we can take steps in that direction. All right, I've got to get to our... <laughs>
Just very quickly, Emma. No, I just, I wanted to agree, but I think this issue about exacerbating inequalities is a huge is issue that has really played out with COVID. And I do think that the movement, I think it actually builds off um, I do think it is building off the Me Too movement, which was calling out sexual harassment. We know Australia, one in three Australian workers experiences sexual harassment in the workplace. It's worse for First Nations people, women with disabilities, gender diverse people. And, and that has, I think, plays into this idea of the Great Resignation, which is around toxic workplace cultures, which is a topic we haven't yet kind of delved into yet. Look, I'm the parent of a daughter who has autism and epilepsy. She's also just developed this year seizures as a result of stress and anxiety. Um, her psychologist considers her capable of working and able of working in an office. However, her employers requested that she work from home due to a fall from a chair when she hit her head. This was the result of a seizure. This has further isolated her from the world. She no longer takes public transport and she doesn't chat with her co-workers. She sits on the couch at home and works. I realise that there's, and I applaud your work too, but I realise there's a lot of people with disabilities that are perhaps enhanced by working from home. But my question is, will the work from home phenomenon further marginalise people with disabilities? And I'm quite concerned about it from oh, my daughter. I'll hear Eliza's uh, answer in a moment. Just to explain mm. for us, Lisa, has the employer here um, have any medical justification for this position? Um, the, there has been three reports from my daughter's psychologist and at the moment we're awaiting the final one and the <coughs> employer will make a decision. I'd like to point out that this is coming very driven by OH&S. Right. The um, HR department has really tried to support her but they're being driven by um, fear. Oh, and is saying she should not be there. Yeah, and uh, we're, we're still negotiating. She's still negotiating, but remembering that uh, she has um, autism and epilepsy yeah. as well as this. Uh, she is with NDIS. She's um, uh, funded to work 16 to 22 hours a week. But if she's told that she can't work sitting on a chair, where can she work? Mm -hmm. And where's her future? She's 22. Eliza. Yeah. Well, like, thank you for opening up. That's, yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I see that as discrimination. <laughs> yeah, just purely discrimination. Um, she should be allowed to work there. Mm. I mean, different if we're in lockdown and we all have to work from home, but once we all start to move back into the workforce, whether it be for hybrid working or where we all go back in, I think it should be choice. There are a lot of people with disability that going to the workplace is a place where you feel connected, where you create community. So it's not all people with disability should work from home. It's not that simple. Yeah. I think for a lot of people with disability, when the lockdowns hit, it was really hard to suddenly work from home and not have that connection and not have yeah. that community. So it's, yeah, I think it's, it's both. I think that there are a lot of people that really need that, that workplace culture. Andy Penn, what would you say to that uh, in terms of you know, how an employer manages a situation like that and ensures that the workplace is more inclusive? Well, look, I think that the companies that are going to be successful in the future are going to be those that can attract the best talent. And I think attracting the best talent is putting in place the sorts of policies that can accommodate. We, we've recently introduced and in trialling with um, trying to improve our neurodiversity within Telstra. We've changed our recruitment processes. So we don't necessarily go through the normal interviewing process for uh, people who've got particular um, mental conditions and, and, and challenges that they have to deal with. But I honestly believe that, you know, particularly in a market where employment is quite tight, really the successful companies are those that are going to be able to really adapt. And we, we introduced a concept called All Role Selects, a bit like Emma, 10 years ago, where the concept is, is that it's the manager's job to work out how to accommodate the flexibility that the employee needs, not the other way around. And you've just got to reverse the, reverse the onus of the, obli of, the, of the obligation. As one of those who has gone through the um, great retirement for real, with all the speeches and prezzies, um, I think the current resignations might be fake news. Is it young, some young people spitting the dummy, or do we really have to worry? All right, we're going to get some quick responses <laughs> here, George. Is this just young folks having a dummy script? <laughs> in the US? Uh, probably not in the US. 
Uh, if it starts to happen here and it just happens with young folk having a dummy spit, I still would like to see it because um, I'd like to see this place shook up a bit. Um, you can't go through an episode like COVID and, and then that. return to all the prior assumptions of 2019. I'd like to see, especially young people, I'd like to see them shake the place up a bit. Yeah, Eliza? Look, I think the fact that we're talking about it tonight and that it's happened in America it gives us a bit of time. <laughs> I think it's up to employers to create the workplaces that people want to work in. So creating inclusive workplaces, hmm. having diversity a priority, making it flexible, thinking about people as people that have families at home and, uh, yeah, so prioritising the people within the organisations and then that will, in, in the end, retain those people. Yeah, Emma, what do you think? Is this? I mean, I think young people maybe are on the right track, and that you know they're saying enough is enough because we have an economic system that historically has, has served a minority, and I think what this is an opportunity for us to truly, really, really, really think about how we can recreate the economic system, our workplaces, to be truly inclusive mm -hmm. and serve all of us, and maybe it's a great revolution. That would be a nice. Great revolution. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Andy. Well, the young people are our future, so um, it's important that we, we listen. And I think that, um, I mean, in fact, there is research that shows that really that between 20 and 40 year olds are twice as likely to want to change jobs at the moment than those that are older than that. Mm. So I think it is, there's evidence of that. And I think, you know, many of those younger uh, people actually, the sorts of things we started the conversation with about purpose and, and values and why we're working and what we're working on and what, does the, what contribution does the organisation make that I'm working for are really, really important to them. Yeah, it matters. Jane, finally to you. Yes, and it's not the great dummy spit. Actually, on the contrary, <laughs> I think it's the next great workplace revolution. Mm. Um, we've seen IT creating revolution. We saw the industrial revolution. I think this is the next revolution. It'll go to purpose. It'll go to how we work. And it'll go to what connections we make that for us are real. And that's for everybody, I think. And I think it'll be a great thing. And that is all the questions we have time for tonight. But we do want to pay tribute to Trevor Crosby, who is a passionate dementia advocate. And he asked a question on Q&A's Aged Care special. Sadly, Trevor passed away last month. Here he is on the program back in February. Does the future hold any hope for me and my dementia mates, all 472,000 of them? 472,000. You think COVID's big? Mm. And our thoughts go out to the Crosby family. In fact, Jane, you were on uh, the panel for that program with Trevor. Mm. He really was um, great at sharing uh, his work and, and what was going on in that community. He was a passionate advocate and I had the privilege of actually talking to Trevor after we finished that program. I sought him out. Um, I told him that my husband's name was Trevor too. We had a bit <laughs> of a bonding experience. But he was a passionate advocate and a representative of the fact that people with dementia have huge amounts to contribute. And uh, I'm so sorry to hear that he has passed and my deepest condolences to his family. Yeah, all right. Well, thanks, Jane. And thanks to our panel tonight, Emma Fulu, Andy Penn, Jane. Holton, George Megalogenis and Eliza Hull.